Uh, once I ran from my house in San Francisco to the start of the Napa Valley Marathon, uh, the route I followed was about 100 miles, and I timed it so that I got there right about the time the gun went off for the marathon. And, and then I ran the Napa Valley Marathon with all the other runners. Uh, it wasn't super speedy. It was three hours and 15 minutes. But um, these are the sort of things we ultra marathoners do. Named by Time Magazine as one of the 100 most influential people in the world, endurance athlete Dean Karnazes has pushed his body and mind to inconceivable limits. He's won the world's toughest foot race, the Badwater Ultra Marathon, where he ran 135 miles nonstop across Death Valley, the hottest place on earth. He's run across the Sahara Desert and run a marathon to the South Pole. He once ran 50 marathons in all 50 U.S. states in 50 consecutive days. And on 10 separate occasions, he's run a 200-mile relay race designed for teams of 12 runners by himself. Dean is an ESPN SB winner and a three-time recipient of Competitor Magazine's Endurance Athlete of the Year Award. He's carried the Olympic torch twice and is a recipient of the President's Council on Sports, Fitness, and Nutrition Lifetime Achievement Award. Dean and his incredible adventures have been featured on the Today Show, 60 Minutes, The Late Show with David Letterman, ESPN, and many other news outlets. He's appeared on the cover of Runner's World, Outside, and Wired magazines, and has been featured in numerous other publications, including Time, Newsweek, People, GQ, and the New York Times. Oh, and he's also a New York Times bestselling author. I just finished reading his revised and updated book, Ultra Marathon Man, Confessions of an All-Night Runner, and I'm delighted to have him on the show. Welcome, Dean, and thanks for joining us on Life Excellence. Well, I must I must admit right out of the gate, I feel very underdressed. <laughs> I see you oh, have a sports it's... coat on. <laughs> At least I put on a collared shirt. Usually I'm wearing the same the same uh, <laughs> No worries about running, that at all. I, thing, yeah. I, I, I was half tempted to put on running clothes and in all of my medals, which are not nearly as many as you have, but um, this is kind of my standard uh, podcast attire. So uh, no, no worries about that at all. Dean, the popularity of ultra marathon running is greater today than ever. I was reading some highlights uh, just the other day from a 23-year study conducted by runrepeat.com. I'm not sure if you're familiar with this study or not, but it stated that participation increased from just 34,000 ultra runners in 1996, probably around um, the time, well, a little bit later, I guess, even than you got started, um, to over 611,000 runners in 2018, and I'm sure it's much higher today. Now, for the average person, even a marathon is unthinkable, and yet apparently there are over 600,000 endurance athletes out there running ultras. What is it about endurance running that's caused it to become so popular? I, I think in a lot of ways, it's it's somewhat of a, um, a knee-jerk or a backlash uh, reaction to the comforts of modern-day living. Uh, and and the distortions of modern day living. I think that uh, some of us are more comfortable struggling <laughs> and doing one thing for a long amount of time versus trying to navigate through the world today, where you know we're all uh, attached to our screens and we've got alerts going off and Twitter Twitter feed or X feed now we got to watch and and so forth. Uh, an ultra marathon is is a way just to reconnect with both the environment and with yourself. I think that um, you you get a very uh, inward glance and glimpse and and insight into who you are, and I think people are looking for these richer, more meaningful experiences in, in a world that's become very devoid of those. That's a pretty extreme way to get that, isn't it? <laughs> it's a purging, I would say. You know, it's a <laughs> it, it's it's a resurrection, and you know, some ultra marathons like a fifty k. Uh, you know, it's more it's more of a race because it's quantifiable. It, you know, it starts usually in the morning and you're finished usually by noon or the early afternoon where these hundred mile or further races, they're multi-day. So you're, you know, you're out there uh, doing one thing for 24 or 48 hours. And that is that's very extreme, I'll admit. 
But I want to talk about the fun factor right off the bat. And of course, I use fun in quotes because I've read your book. Um, I, I've read other accounts of ultra runners and ultra marathons and some of these um, extreme runs by people like David Goggins, for example. And it, as you know, a lot of recreational activities that we engage in, we do for fun. And I play squash, for example, and have lots of fun doing it. I play um, comp- not super competitively, but sort of club competitively. I like to win, um, but it's also a lot of fun while I'm playing. And I enjoy running too. And and I would I, I don't know that I'd call it fun necessarily, but I certainly enjoy it. Now, in fairness, I've never run an ultra marathon. I ran just one marathon years ago and through that experience decided that half marathons were more my jam and I'm totally content with that. Um, But I don't know that I'd use the word fun to describe even a half marathon. If fun isn't the right word to describe what you do, endurance, running, that experience, how do you describe it? And that's a good way. That's, I, that's an interesting perspective because I, I don't think fun necessarily always has to be so enjoyable. I think that I was thinking about this last weekend when I ran um, the San Francisco Marathon. It was my idea of fun. And I'm looking around me at the people, you know, and they're suffering as much as I'm suffering. But it's it's our way of having fun. I mean, yeah, I used to go to, you know, nightclubs or whatever when I was younger, or concerts even, to have fun. But now I <laughs> I go run a marathon or an ultra marathon to have fun. And it's just it's just a different perspective on on the term fun. And uh I I would describe uh running and suffering and and you know, adversity as as fun to me. Okay, that's fair. So I I was thinking and and I hadn't thought about this when I was preparing, but the the word rewarding um, just popped into my mind as you were talking. And, and it certainly is that, isn't it? I think it's satisfying. I, you know, I've never, I've never entered, I've only entered one race, uh, my whole life. Uh, and that was the Badwater ultra marathon. And I say that because most of the time I, I go to a run, uh, I, I don't see it as a race. I see it more as an experience, uh, as an adventure. And I think that's why I've, you know, persisted in the sport for over three decades is that, uh, you know, I, I, I value performance, my best performance above all, whether I end up on a podium or not is really makes no difference. Uh, I just, I value the overall experience and, you know, the, the internal satisfaction of knowing that I did my best, that I ran as hard as I could. I, ne- I left nothing on the course that I gave it my all and that I was just completely spent when I crossed that finish line. And I think that that is, very satisfying in a way. And would you say that that's how most or all endurance athletes approach that, that it's more, um, it, it's not a competition to win an event. It's, um, it, it, it's something else. And, and I guess it could be a lot of things, right? It could be just the desire to, um, finish if we're talking about, a. um, even a 200 mile relay with 12 people. I mean, for the, for people who are running that as a team, um, finishing it is, is an accomplishment. Um, but certainly some of the running across bad water, for example, or, um, a, a longer distance run, I think some people, you know, they, they, uh, their motivations are different. You know, we're all motivated by different things. And I think some people are motivated by, uh, the time that it takes, uh, to run a race. And, you know, they're trying to, uh, even if they're not trying to, to win or even win their age group, they're competing against themselves that they want to, you know, set a, a PR uh, or a PB of personal best. And I think a lot of people are driven by that and that's their motivation. Uh, and that's fine. I think, you know, we're all, uh, unique and it's just not the way I'm hardwired. Uh, I don't, I don't care about my time. I really don't. I I care about whether I gave it my all. And I think the only way, and the only time I felt like I failed, even when I finished a race is when I've come across the finish line and felt like, ah, I could, I could have left some more on the course. Like I, I didn't push as hard as I, as I could have. I didn't live up to the athlete that I am. What caused you to think that? Was it how, 
how well you felt that as you're crossing the finish line? <laughs> yeah, ironically. I mean, I can think of one <laughs> race, um, you know, the Vermont Trail 100. And I, again, I didn't set out to win. I did win. And at the finish, I thought, I'm not even that tired. Like, what you, you could have gone a lot harder than that. I kept waiting for something to go wrong and nothing went wrong. And when I crossed the finish line, it was kind of unsatisfying. Like, huh, <laughs> you could have got, you could have probably pushed yourself harder than that. Yeah. That's interesting. Tell us about your background. When did you start running and what initially drew you to long distance running? Well, I used to love to run when I was a young boy. So some of my earliest childhood re recollections are from running home from kindergarten and when I was five years old. And, uh, you know, this, this was in a different era. I mean, this was um, California, you know, in the 60s. I'll date myself um, in, in early 70s, you know, and it was kind of free spirited. My parents were very, very free spirited. They were, you know, kind of hippies, if you will. Uh, I continued running until I was in junior high school. And we won the, the state championships. And so I thought that's as far as I'll ever take my running career. And I stopped running when I was 15. And then, uh, you know, I went to, I somehow graduated from high school. I'm not even sure how. And I somehow got into college, which nowadays I never, <laughs> my grades never would have made, made it for me to get into college. And then I went to graduate school and then I went to business school. And I had a very comfortable corporate job in San Francisco. But I was internally not very fulfilled. And I was in a bar uh, on my 30th birthday doing what you know a lot of folks do on their 30th birthday. I was in there drinking with my buddies. And at midnight, I told them I was leaving. And they said, hold it, it's your 30th birthday. Let's have another round of tequila to celebrate. And I said, no, I'm going to run 30 miles to celebrate instead. And they looked at me and they said, but you're not a runner. You're drunk. <laughs> and I said, I am, but I'm still going to do it. And I walked out of the bar and I'll never forget, I didn't even own running gear at the time, but I had on these, these comfortable silk boxer shorts, like these silk underwear. And I peeled off my pants and threw them down the alleyway and just started stumbling off into the night, heading south, knowing there was a town called Half Moon Bay that was 30 miles from San Francisco. And I thought, just run to Half Moon Bay. And uh, that night forever changed the course of my life. I, you know, after, afterward, I decided I was going to become an ultra marathoner. <laughs> <laughs> that's remarkable have you so you, you've been running a long time you've this has been your career for as mm -hmm. you said more than three decades have you ever heard a, a, a more uh, fascinating or unusual story about somebody running their first 30 mile race <laughs> no i mean <laughs> I, I wrote about that in my in my book ultra marathon man and, you know, that, that story I think is, is singular and unique. I know other people that have done kind of crazy things on their 30th birthday or crazy things, uh, after getting drunk in a bar, <laughs> there's certainly worse things you could do than run 30 miles. But as far as that goes, I haven't heard anyone deciding they're going to run 30 miles on their 30th birthday when, when they were drunk. Yeah, that's a great story. Um, so how, Walk us through then, how did you get from your 30th birthday, running 30 miles to entering in your first official race, your first ultra? Yeah. So after the 30 mile uh, all night uh, jaunt, if you will, I say, I don't want to say run because I was definitely <laughs> hobbling and stumbling <laughs> and, you know, to call it running would be an overstatement. But after, after that night, I started running pretty regularly. And I thought I was in pretty good shape. I, I didn't have a coach. You know, I was just running by myself, uh, but I was usually passing people. Uh, there was a track that went out to the Golden Gate Bridge that was, that was popular, and I would usually pass a lot of people. And, and one day I was running, and I was coming back to my house. And, you know, being in San Francisco, inevitably, you've got to climb a hill uh, to get back to your house. And I, as I was climbing up this hill, two guys blew past me. I mean, they, they just had me choking on their dust and it was as though they were a different species. I mean, these guys were so fit and they just blew past me, went up over the hill. And I, I thought, wow, I'd love to talk to those guys, but I'll never see them again. Well, I got <laughs> to the top of the hill and they were both up there doing push-ups. <laughs> uh, 
So I, I coaxed out of them that they were training for something. And I said, well, you know, is it a race? And they said, yes. And I said, um, are, are there hills involved? And the guy said, no, there are mountains involved. I said, oh, okay. <laughs> and I said, well, how far is this race? And he said, it's 50 miles. And I said, hold it. That's, that's impossible. A human cannot run 50 miles. I mean, where, you know, where are the hotels along the way? Where are the, you know, the, the, the campgrounds or whatever? And he said, no, buddy, the, the gun goes off and you start running. You, you stop when you cross the finish line. And his friend kind of elbowed him. And they looked at me like, if you cross the finish line, kind of like <laughs> there's no way this guy would ever cross the finish line. And, and then they just took off and ran away. So I went to the library. I don't know if you remember what a library is, but I went to a library <laughs> and I remember the, remember the Dewey Decibel system? Sure. <laughs> I, I found out what this race was called and I signed up. Uh, you know, I sent in my application in the mail and I went and did this 50 mile race and it was by far the toughest thing I'd ever done. I mean, it, it took every, every cell in my body to finish that race and, and it really hurt. And I was in the, like the, the finishing area, the finishing tent area, like wrapped in this Mylar blanket, you know, dehydrated, shivering. And I saw those two guys that I, that had passed me on the way up the hill and they were high-fiving each other saying, we qualified, we qualified. And I thought for, for what the insane asylum? Like, what did you qualify for? <laughs> and they said, no, we qualified for the Western States 100 mile endurance run. And I said, hold it. Did you say a hundred miles, like twice as far as we just ran? He's like, yeah, it's a hundred mile race. And I said, or, you know, where does this race take place? He said, well, you start at the base of a ski resort, you run to the very top of the highest peak, and then you run 95 miles from there through the mountains, uh, to a town called Auburn. He said, I said, well, what do you do at night? Like, where, where do you, you know, where do you stop? He said, no, you put on a headlamp and you run at night. He said, you cross a river in the middle of the night. I said, well, how do you eat? He said, you eat while you run. You do everything as you're moving forward. And I, I was just blown away that there was anything even remotely like this that a human could do. And as they were walking away, they looked at me and they said, hey, buddy, you qualified too. And as they were leaving and they said that to me, as I sat there, I thought, you have to do this race. Like you will never live down this moment for the rest of your life unless you try this race. You'll always think those guys told you you qualified and you didn't try. So I just knew at that point I had to enter the Western States 100 mile endurance run. And the next year I did. That's awesome. And obviously you've run it several times since then. How many times have you run that in, in total? Uh, 13. 13. Hmm. What did you learn about yourself as you first started stretching the limits of human potential as an ultra runner? You know, I mean, you learn that um, limitations are, are self-contrived. I think that's the biggest lesson you learn. When you do something that you once thought was impossible, it, it opens up other realms to you of in, things that you thought were impossible. So it broadens your your vision as far as what is achievable and you know what you can do i think that's probably the most important lesson um you know i say that uh an ultra marathon uh, builds character but it also reveals character mm. so you learn about your strategies for coping with uh failure you know when you're at that point where you feel like i can't take another step i'm done how do you respond uh, you know, do you, do you draw on an inner strength or do you quit? Uh, I've done both and I've learned that, you know, quitting at what they call a DNF, it, it, you know, it, it might save some pain, you know, for the rest of that day, but the pain doesn't go away the rest of your lifetime. So I've learned that, you know, uh, not failing is really kind of, um, critical when you're doing these ultra marathons, because you proved yourself that you can do something without failing when you're, when you're struggling. Well, and those decision points come multiple times, right? It's not that you're, you're running a hundred miles and, and you get to, you hit a wall at wherever 60 miles. And you, at that point, you, 
make a decision to to not finish or continue on those decision points are happening i'm guessing multiple times it certainly depends on the race the conditions how things are going with you but it it's not a a one time and you decide oh i'm going to keep going and and then you finish the way, the race right it, you're absolutely right and you know it's also it becomes somewhat tactical uh, you know when you run a half marathon you probably have some certainty that you'll reach the finish line. I mean, even if you cramp up real bad at mile 10 or 11, you know that you can just, you can walk it in if you had to. Uh, you know, with an ultra marathon, you're, you're trying to be, you know, at your peak performance for maybe 24 or 30 hours. So mm -hmm. you never really know, <laughs> am I pushing too hard or am I, am I holding back too much? And so you're absolutely right. You have those points along the way. And then you might feel a little niggle in your quad. You might think, oh, I'm getting a cramp. You know, what do I do? Or, or then you might feel like uh, I'm, I'm getting bloated, like I, I might, I'm having GI distress. So you're dealing with issues um, the whole time. And it becomes somewhat tactical in how you get yourself to the finish line. I can't imagine the physical demands of a... Um... In, in let's just say bad water, 135 mile race, um, like period under the best of conditions, a, a temperate climate, let alone in, in a desert, in the hottest place on earth. How much of distance running, especially in extreme conditions, and you've run in very hot conditions and the coldest of conditions, it, how much of that is physical and how much of it is mental? I remember reading, you said that your legs can only carry you so far that running great distances is mostly with your mind and with your heart. Give us some sense of the demands of endurance running and how you get to the finish line, even when your legs are um, saying, no, I'm, I'm not going to get you there. Sorry. Uh, well, you know, it, it does come back to training a bit. Uh, you know, I've, I've learned through experience that you can't you can't compromise or skimp in your training. You can't take the path of least resistance. You can't take the easy road. You have to pay your dues because inevitably when you get to that, you know, come to Jesus moment where you're thinking, I, can I keep going or do I have to stop? You, you turn inward and you say, look, I paid my dues. I did the training. I took all the necessary uh, steps that I needed to, to keep going. Uh, because we can't fool ourselves. If you skimped in your training, you know, you're going to say to yourself, damn, you know, I, I didn't, I didn't train hard enough. Like I, I knew I had to do it and I didn't do it. And now I'm paying the price. So it starts with your training and, and always, always putting in the extra effort and every workout, every single workout, you always give 110%. And that's kind of my credo. I don't ever give less than 110% in any workout, no matter if it's doing 25 burpees or you know, running 250 miles. So it starts with the training and having that confidence and belief in yourself and your abilities. And then when you get to a point where your body is just pulverized, for lack of a better term, it, it does become a, a mental jostle. And you, you know, you, to me, you know, there's a term embrace the suck. When things get bad, I kind of make fun of it. Like, oh, this is horrible. I don't think I've ever been this destroyed. Like, oh, my toenail fell off. <laughs> that's good. Oh, you know, can it get worse? Oh, I'm cramping now. Oh, it's, that's even better. This will bring the shit on. I love it. So kind of <laughs> embracing the, the misery of it all uh, is, is very important to me. And then when things get to the point where I'm ready to collapse, and, and that happens, I very much uh, blank out everything. I don't think. People say, what do you, what do you think about when things get tough? And thinking is the problem. I just mm. try to execute. And it becomes so granular that I just say to myself, take your next footstep to the best of your ability. Okay, take your next footstep to the best of your ability. Don't think about the finish line. Don't think about anything in the future. Don't reflect on the past. Just think about one thing, your next footstep and your next footstep. And it's almost like a Zen-like trance you put yourself into. And I, I've been like that for sometimes two or three hours where I'm just so focused on nothing else. I've got the blinders on to everything but my next footstep. 
it seems as I hear you describing that, and and again, I've read other stories about people doing, especially the extreme events. Like there's a fine line between what I'll call these ultimate tests of human resolve. So, and and it sounds like you've built. Um, I, I I don't know that you can train for it before a race, but as you're going through those experiences, I I think maybe you build some. Um, context for that or some kind of mental um, uh, muscle for that, that, that the next time you experience that, you have a, a reference that you're able to fall back on. But it seems like there's a fine line between that, the, the, the human resolve, and, and just frankly, like sheer insanity. You mentioned um, the the two guys at the who finished the race and and they qualified and you asked them if they qualified for the insane asylum. Do you okay. just be straight with me? Do you have to be a little crazy to compete in ultras? I, I don't know if I'm qualified to answer that question. <laughs> I, I mean, <laughs> I, I think of myself as very sane and rational, but. When I look at my behavior, sometimes uh, it's it's just the opposite. So I I don't I mean I don't know. It's just it's 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 my way of just going fully into what I what I really think I was put on earth to do, and that is just to run great distances and to challenge myself. You know, Patton uh, said famously of war, uh, "God help me, but I love it so." And I repeat that to myself when I'm at war. And to me, being at war is, you know, an ultra marathon. You're at war just with yourself. And, you know, God help me, but I love it so. Well, and I, I'm kidding with you a little bit, Dean, because the, <laughs> the, the reality is I, I'm super impressed. Our, our show is called Life Excellence. And what you've done and what you're doing is the epitome of, of excellence in, in my mind. So, um, you know, as Picasso, uh, of, you know, people could look at some of his paintings and, and question his sanity, I guess, in the same way that, it, that I was sort of kidding with you about it. Um, but we, whatever labels we attach to it, your achievements are so incredibly impressive. Dean, when you and I first met, and I, I want to say, and this was a while ago, I want to say it was around 2007, and it was at a John Maxwell event in Atlanta. Um, your book, Ultra Marathon Man, it was already a bestseller, but I, I think it had just been out maybe um, a couple years at that point. And you had accumulated at that point, and you think 2007, that was 16 years ago, right? Um you had accumulated enough accolades and achievements to fill an entire career, including mm-hmm. such milestones um, that we haven't talked about already, um, like running 350 miles in eight o- 80 hours without sleep, um, running a, a marathon to the South Pole. We talked about that a little bit. Running um, This one I want to know more about, running 148 miles in 24 hours on a treadmill and then, of course, competing, completing the um, the relay race by yourself, which you, um, I think, had done several times by then. But it, as I think about these amazing, amazing feats, they reveal um, the determination and persistence that clearly embodies your life. And I, I was so incredibly impressed um, back then, and and I'm just as impressed or even more impressed now. Um, Dean, most people aren't going to run ultras. Um, I, I'm pretty sure I'm not. And um, uh, although there are probably listeners and viewers who do, um, which is why they're listening to or, or watching the show now, but a lot of our, our listeners or, and viewers won't run um, distance runs. Um, but we all have milestones that we're trying to reach in various domains of our life. What advice do you have for people who might be facing what seems to be insurmountable challenges? So the equivalent of um, your toenail falling off or, or maybe something worse in their personal or professional lives. Uh, you know, I'll, there, there's a saying in, in running, um, you know, uh, 
plan the race and race the plan. So I think that when you set a goal, uh, inevitably there's going to be obstacles that happen along the way. And what I've noticed is that uh, these obstacles uh, tend to sometimes uh, exacerbate. So there's becomes multiple obstacles. <laughs> and the weight of that is is overwhelming. And, you know, the distance to get to the finish line seems not not achievable. And I would say again that, you know, if you have the plan, put on the blinders, take your next footstep to the best of your ability. Just execute. Don't think about it. Just execute and get so absorbed in the execution that you forget about everything else. You know, I, you hear a lot about the flow state, but if you can put yourself in that flow state and just deal with the issues uh, systematically, uh, it, 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 it's achievable. And, you know, once you can do that, once you have a, a small success, uh, you get a taste for what it takes. And it really is, you know, it's, it's a lot of work. And I don't think anyone that's successful doesn't work their ass off. Well, I hope I can use that term. <laughs> you can. But, I mean, I, you know, I've been doing this for 30 years. And, you know, just for me to, you know, to get to the finish line of an ultra now, is, is it's tough. I mean, it's, you know, I'm 60 years old. It's not getting any easier. But I'm working doubly hard. And I've just, I've embraced that work ethic as, as just part of my ethos. And I think that I just have a belief that I can get through almost anything just by systematically breaking it down and just relentlessly pursuing my goal. Do you apply that with the same level of, um, I'll just say intentionality in other areas of your life as well? You find that that your running career and in your endurance experience helps you to um, to overcome obstacles or or to achieve or to succeed in other areas of your life. It to an extent, uh, you know, I, I've I've known for a while that uh, that sort of bullheadedness can only get you so far. Being bullheaded like that and and so focused and driven can get you to the finish of a, an ultra marathon. But when you're dealing with teams of people in group settings, uh, you know you can alienate yourself and you can alienate others by just having that solidarity of purpose and that relentless, you know, hammering of let's go, let's go, let's go. So you know I think that in dealing with business situations, having softer skills and having empathy. Uh, is really important. And I think empathy starts with knowing who you are. I'm, I'm 100% Greek. And you know, the Oracle at Delphi said, know thyself. And I think I have a pretty good understanding of my strengths and my weaknesses. And I think I've learned that by pushing myself. And, you know, I hate to say, I hate to use the cliche going out of my comfort zone. But how do you learn about yourself? You, you do something that is seem seemingly unachievable. You bite off more than you can chew and you see how you deal with it as, as you're trying to digest it. So those kind of skills cross over from, from running to life, but the softer skills I think are more important in, in everyday uh, living and in business settings uh, and in life settings than, than running an ultra marathon. Yeah, that's well said. Share more about the discipline, passion, and other attributes needed to succeed at a high level, whether we're talking about running or other areas of life. You know, one thing I, I think is energy. <laughs> if you look at good, good leaders, you know, they seem energetic. And I think that's because their passions are aligned with who they are. Um, again, I, you know, I go back to the Oracle of Delphi who said, know thyself, but the second verse, well, there was three verses, but the, the third verse is, uh, be thyself. And if you can know who you are and be that person you are, then you're going to succeed. And I, I accepted on my 30th birthday that, Hey, you're, you're just a runner, <laughs> you know, you're no genius. Uh, you know, you know, Picasso, you can't draw, you can't sing, you can't dance. You're kind of marginal at a lot of things. You're dyslexic and you're an introvert, but you can run. And I somehow 30 years later made it into a life and a career and a very fulfilling one. 
Just for the record, I don't think Picasso ever ran an ultra marathon. I'm not sure about <laughs> that. We can fact check that, but don't don't cut yourself short. Mm. <laughs> we we all have our own skills. Dean, what do you think it is that gets in the way and prevents us from achieving our full potential? And again, whether we're talking about running or or just life in general, I think it's you know we are our own worst enemy. I, I think that um, you know we we get in the way of ourselves more than anything else. Uh, I think that ego certainly holds people back. Uh, they might think it's moving them forward, but it's just the opposite. So I think that um, you know the other thing that I've learned is you, you know I think it's pretty well documented that maybe up to our thirties, you know we 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 were curious we learn about the world and then from that point on we start applying everything we know about the world to conduct our life moving forward and to me i try to have that curiosity still that simple uh you know um just just inquisitiveness about the world about how things work and really interested in it and uh i think that having that curiosity uh is very helpful no matter what you're doing was the curiosity part of what caused you to explore different runs? So once you had done the Western States 100, then I think the the year after you did that, the first time you ran Badwater for the first time, and the South Pole uh, Marathon was not too long after that. Was that um, did did curiosity play a part in that? Wanting to um, know either what else you could do or whether you could do the same thing under different extreme conditions. Tell us more about that. Uh, yeah, I think, you know, I've always viewed running as more than racing. You know, every, every, you know, every racer is a runner, but not every runner is a racer. So I've never defined running as, as winning races or even time in a race. I've looked at it more as a, uh, artistic expression. So like running 50 marathons in 50 states in 50 days, that was something I just conceived in my head as a, as a great challenge and a great adventure, a great way to see the country uh, and, and push myself. And I think that um, things like, like that, I mean, I, I could go on and on with the list of other sorts of things I've done, you know, like run across Haiti, um, run across Uzbekistan and Kyrgyzstan and Kazakhstan, these are not races. You know, these are just things that I've uh, come up with on my own as, as something challenging, something unique, something adventurous. And I think that's why I've persisted or lasted in the sport is that I don't just view, you know, just go to organized races uh, as the end all to ultra marathoning. I see it as something much bigger than that. Have you ever heard yourself called the, the this is a, a just a sort of random but have you ever heard yourself called the godfather of ultra marathons? <laughs> I, I mean people you're have said legend. like wow you're you're a legend and I, I don't think I'm a legend at all because I, you know I when I first started uh you know there there's a, a lot of people doing it before me and I look up at, at those men and women and think, that, you know, those guys were there way before I was there. I'm too young to be a legend and I'm, I never will be because, you know, my place in this sport is, is it's different uh, just because it's unique and I've done so many diverse sort of things, but I'll never see myself as like the godfather of ultra running. I mean, I introduced the sport to a lot of people through my books, but I, I don't think I, I did anything other than, you know, said, wow, there are people doing these crazy things. Here it is. And maybe giving people permission to try it themselves. So I think mostly through my writing, uh, you know, people have come to know of me and, and kind of learned about um, the things I've done. But I still I still have a lot of I mean, maybe when I'm 80 and, and I finish an ultra marathon, you can call me the godfather then. <laughs> Fair enough. I, I think you're a little humble. Um, and your accomplishments are certainly significant, even if you stop today. And I hope that you continue until you're 100 and maybe beyond. Dean, as you think about the, this amazing career that you've had over 30 years, 30 plus years, what stands out for you as being especially gratifying? 
What are you most proud of? I think that, you know, the, the, having my family along with me has been the most gratifying. You know, my, my parents have been to every single Western states that I've run from the first one to the 13th one. They've been there. Uh, and so to have them as part of this adventure, it makes it more than just just me just doing something for myself. Uh, they've really embraced kind of my running and this kind of ultra marathoning lifestyle. So we've we've traveled all over the world together and we've had some great adventures. So I think that the inclusion of my family has made it uh, a more complete vocation for me. You know, people say, what is, you know, your your proudest um, ultra marathon? And I always say, well, it wasn't an ultra marathon. It was a 10K. And they said, why? That's only, you know, that's only 6.2 miles. And that's because I ran a 10K with my daughter, Alexandria, on her 10th birthday. Hmm. So, you know, that that moment, well, nothing will ever surpass that moment. That's awesome. Do, does your wife or do your children run distance runs or, or are they as avid as you are in the sport? My wife runs if she's being chased. <laughs> <laughs> And, you know, my kids love to run, uh, but they're, they're not racers. They're not big racers at all. Yeah. Uh, they just love to run just for, you know, the, um, the clarity and the, you know, the, the, the mental wellness that running gives you. Uh, they have yeah. both raced. My son has run um, uh, a marathon and an ultra marathon, just kind of singular events. And my daughter and I ran the the, this you should add this to your your calendar if you haven't done it the the wine country half marathon so it starts in napa and ends in sonoma and at mile i think eight or nine they start serving wine at the age stations <laughs> so we, we had a lot of and it finishes at a winery so kind that of takes that you back to your 30th birthday <laughs> <laughs> yeah no well i i run for the same reason that your your kids do for uh, it sounds like for exercise for um, I like the mental aspect of running even more than the physical aspect of running. And the other thing that I really like about running is that you can put on a pair of running shoes and go out and run. So you don't need special equipment. You don't need, you can run in silk box, boxer shorts, although it's probably better to have some running shorts and, and maybe a nice running shirt, but it's, it's really easy to do. And the other thing is anybody can do it. Right, it's not um, limited by um, so socioeconomic status, and and you've run all over the world, so you've probably had. I, I'm going to guess, like maybe, and I've been to Haiti several times, and it, maybe you had um, Haitian kids running alongside of you when you were running, and it's wonderful. Um, it's just a great form of exercise, first of all, not just physically, but again mentally. But I I love that. Um, really anybody can do it. And, and I said, you need a good pair of running shoes, but you know, that that's not even the case, right? There are plenty of runners, um, in, especially in impoverished parts of the world who are running, uh, great distances with no shoes. Yeah. I, you know, I, uh, something that you never mentioned, I've been a U.S. athlete ambassador. Uh, and I've been on three sports diplomacy envoys. The most recent one was to uh, the South Pacific, to an island called Fiji. And we did a 100-kilometer run uh, around Fiji. And we were going through these villages in the hills. And I'll never forget these, these boys and girls. They were running 10 or 15 miles next to me barefoot. on a, It was like a, a graded fire road. And they didn't even have water. I was giving them water, and they, they wouldn't even accept water. And oh it was, it's Fiji, so it's hot and humid. And they were giggling and laughing. They just thought it was the most fun. And they're barefoot. And they just, we just had such a great time. Yeah. That's a great story. And, mm. and again, I'm sure it's one of many that you have. Dean, I know we're all capable of so much more than we think we can accomplish. And you've demonstrated that repeatedly throughout your career. What do you say to someone who says they don't have enough time or talent to pursue their goals or dreams, or someone who raises other objections about why they can't do something. You have great context for um, having some really strong reasons to not continue what you're doing, and yet you've continued over and over and over again. 
You know, I think that running is, um, it's the great equalizer. Like you said, I mean, it, 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 no matter what color our skin is, what language we speak, what God we worship, no matter our socioeconomic level, uh, running is something you, that unites humans. It's a commonality we share across the globe. So I would first remind people that, and, and then I think that everyone should run a marathon. And I say this, not lightly, and I, I know a lot of people that are, are listening or watching this are saying, oh yeah, well, I, I could never run, uh, run a, a marathon. I could never, I could never run a marathon. Ask yourself why, <laughs> why can't you? And I think that's the very reason you need to run a marathon because it proves to you, you can do something that you thought you never could do. And even if you walk it, I think crossing that finish line will be an experience you will never forget. When they put that medal around your neck, you will remember that for the rest of your life. And it'll be the most gratifying and satisfying and rewarding moment you can ever remember. So I really encourage people, sign up for a marathon. Uh, there's a lot of online training programs and plans. Uh, just get to the finish line. It, you don't have to do it fast. <laughs> You know, you don't have to do it pretty, just just do it. That's very well said, and I appreciate you sharing that. And it's absolutely true. You receive all of those gifts from that experience. And the other thing it gives you is it gives you leverage, right, for other experiences. And, and having been through it, and again, I, I only did it once, um, and maybe now I'm encouraged to, to try it again, but, um, love the, the halves a little easier to train for. Um, as you said, I'm pretty sure I'm, I'm going to finish, but, um, whether I ever do another one or not, I, I know that I did that one and I knew what it took to get off the couch, um, every day, multiple times a week, and go out and run and train and do what it took to accomplish that. And I can tell you that I've accomplished so much more in my life because I did that and having the reference of that success, that experience, and uh, being able to apply some of the same things that it took to um, train and finish the marathon that we bump up against in other challenges that we have in our lives, both personally and professionally. So I really appreciate that. I can't let you go without, um, I mentioned it along the way that you ran a, was it 148 hour of 148 miles in 24 hours on a treadmill? Tell us about that. <laughs> and it gets even better. Uh, it was, I was suspended on a two story platform hoisted above time, <laughs> hoisted above times square. Of course you were. <laughs> yes. And all the jumbotrons were filming me the entire time I was doing this. So, um, yeah, it was, it was on summer solstice. So it was the longest day of the year is, um, June 21st. And it was, you know, it was for, um, uh, part of it was a fundraiser for prostate cancer. A friend of mine, um, had prostate cancer. So it was a fundraiser, which makes me proud, but running for 24 hours in, in those conditions was, it was, it was psychotic. <laughs> I'll admit. <laughs> I mean, I kept thinking, you know, come hour 20, 21, when I'm so tired and, you know, you've got this narrow belt on the treadmill and I'm thinking if I step one, you know, one foot off this belt, I'm going to get shot off the back of this treadmill like a sack of potatoes you know i'm going to splatter on the asphalt but it was a very manhattan moment yeah <laughs> and i love running on a treadmill i tell people that un most people hate running on a treadmill right i actually enjoy it and i've said for a long time that you can put a treadmill in front of a blank wall and i could run forever that's literally how i described it after reading what you did i'm never going to say that again to anybody <laughs> <laughs> Dean, it, it's such an honor to have you on the show. Thank you so much. It's great to see you again. And I think everyone listening or watching will agree that you're a true inspiration for both runners and non-runners alike. Thanks for everything. I appreciate you. Thanks for having me run by. Thanks for tuning in to Life Excellence. Please support the show by subscribing, sharing it with others, Posting about today's show with ultramarathon man Dean Carnazes on social media, 
and leaving a rating and review. You can also learn more about me at brianbardis.com. Until next time, dream big dreams and make each day your masterpiece.